Hello and welcome to this very special at the races.com Royal Ascot preview program in association with William Hill. I'm Sean Boyce, but that's not important right now. What is important is the panel that we have assembled. Now, some people said this could not be done. Some said the budget would never stretch to it. Some people were scared that the combined punting powers of these two personages would cause profound palpitations in the punting public. We said, we'll take our chances. For the first time ever on the same bill, the first time in the same set, the same programme, the same studio, at the races, legends both, Kevin Blake and Hugh Taylor are with us. I'm happy to see you both. You know, if I could possibly go wrong after that introduction. I'm not sure how we follow that. <laughs> it is extraordinary, though, because you've been with At The Races for a long time and working on the website for a long time. You've been part of At The Races since before it was At The Races, Hugh. Yeah, and, and yet we've never got the two of you together. You know why? Don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> We flew you in, first class from Ireland, straight into Heathrow today. Everything went smoothly, I hope? Uh, relatively, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Hugh, you came from Guildford. <laughs> yeah, all the way. Yeah, no expense, man. In the, in the pouring rain. It's lashing down now. On a serious note, it's, it's been lashing down all day in the southeast of England, including, presumably, Ascot. You're, you're up the road from Ascot to yeah. Guildford, Hugh. It's, I mean, right now, it's going to be having an impact, but what do we think it might hold in store? Well, we're in June, so in theory there's plenty of time for it to dry out still. I'm sure it's going to be very testing if, if we were racing tomorrow, but um, another eight days. So uh, let's see what the weather brings out. I don't trust weather forecasters beyond about four or five days anyway. No. You know, certainly up to seven or eight days they can be reasonably accurate. And we're not doing weather forecasters a disservice. They will say themselves there's not a huge amount of skill in their forecast beyond mm. a few days, so it's difficult. Absolutely. I mean, the science of weather forecasting has actually improved yeah. dramatically Absolutely. in the last 20 years, but... Um, we don't know, is what we're yeah. saying. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. Well, the one thing we'll say is that Ascot does drain exceptionally well. So if they Certainly get... the straight course. Yeah. Yes. We can make that differentiation, can we? Yeah, well, ho look, hopefully it won't be an issue. Hopefully we'll get three, four, five dry days in the build-up and yep. we'll have the, the sort of surface we're accustomed to and expect at Royal Ascot. But as we've seen at, at Cheltenham a couple of times in recent years, the, no matter how well, well it drains... If there is a heap of rain close to close to race time, well, we're, we're still in trouble. Quite recently, so mm. it can happen. We will keep a weather eye on the weather. We'll try and bear that in mind in our discussions today. Now, don't forget, of course, that there's loads of facilities for you to do your research, including the At the Races website, which has a fantastic. We call it a micro site, which I always think does it a disservice because it's a mega site, really, isn't it? It's got everything, uh, every single race up there already: race cards, odds, etc., etc. All the um, Stats and trends for the key races have been put up. Loads of runner profiles of individual things. There's already some anti-post selections up there. There will be more information going on there all the time during the course of the build-up to Royal Ascot. Now, if you're watching this programme right now, first of all, thank you and welcome. If you're watching on the At The Races website, you're very welcome. If you're watching live on Facebook, and I know many of you are logging on all the time watching on Facebook right now, then join in make a contribution, post on that Facebook page, the, the page that you're on right now. If you're on Facebook, uh, make a post. It might be a selection, maybe your tip for the week, your nap for the week, and we will select one of those to be a winner of our prize, which is two tickets for Saturday. So if you can get to Ascot on the Saturday, we've got a couple of tickets to give away to the best post tonight. So do post on that Facebook page. We'd love to hear from you during the course of this evening on Facebook. It's a way of getting involved, and you could win uh, those two tickets for Saturday. We used to call it the Heath Day. It's now proper a Royal Ascot. You can say you've been to the proper Royal Ascot on the Saturday and great racing to look forward to on the Saturday as well. We're going to run through all of the, the big races, the grade ones, uh, because we, we pretty much know where we stand with most of those and we'll, we'll pick up other bits and pieces as we go through. But we've got Hugh Taylor here and it wouldn't be Hugh without one of these. The punting pointer which we associate with you, Hugh, from years gone by and, and uh, by which we mean you know, a, a bit of an angle yeah, that's, that's a good word for it, angle. Yeah, we're looking at trying to find something that can help us. Not necessarily make shortcuts, but 
um, help us give a bit more insight into where we might find a bit of value. Shortcut is not a dirty word, though, in a way, because we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds of runners during, during the week, and if you can find something that gives you zones in your focus on a particular thing, that helps. Absolutely. There are certain, certainly um, definite methods that I use when I'm looking at Royal Ascot in particular, because, as you say, it is a big week. There's seven races every day, and there's um, uh, big fields, usually. Uh, and you need some way of sorting out the wheat from the chaff. That's interesting because many people would look at that and say, well, surely Ascot of all meetings is about pure class. You know, the, the cream will rise to the, to the top. But there are, what, trends or well, whether you're, that you would look to? Whether you're betting at Royal Ascot or on an all-weather meeting on a Monday evening, it's the same thing. You're trying to find something that the bookmakers don't know. You're trying to find an angle into something where you therefore think that the horse is a bigger price than it should be. Yep. Um, so that's, that's what it's all about. OK. Kick us off, then, with your first punting pointer for Ascot 2019. Yeah, this is something I've point, pointed out in my column before, prior to Royal Ascot. But, um, Dubawi, as a sire, has a, an absolutely outstanding record at Royal Ascot. Um, 25, winners from, 25 wins from 95 runners. I'm specifically talking about one mile, two furlongs, one mile, four furlong races. Although OK, it, now, it, that's the small print. Always read the small yeah. print, viewers and, and listeners, because Dubawi size that's over 10 and 12 furlongs, basically. Yeah. He does have a decent record at other trips, yeah. ask it. This is where he's particularly excel. Okay. That's a, Are we talking all races or stakes races rather than handicaps? This or? is all races, although a lot of the profits have come in handicaps. Oh, OK. Um, and it's over both Royal Ascot and other Ascot meetings. Um, and if you, it's a big level stakes profit, but if you look at the actual over expected, which is basically how many more winners he's had as a sire than the SPs would indicate, yes. that's a huge number, 1.82. He should have had 13.73 wins according to the SPs and the percentage of the market that they took out. And he's actually had, I think, as you say, 25. So it's a significant number in excess of what you'd say. I'm, I'm just going to make a very brief timeout symbol because you touched on something there that not everyone is familiar with the A-stroke a E you'll often see mm -hmm. it written as actual again versus expected. By expected we mean what the market predicts would happen based on the probability assigned by the odds. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, if all those Dabawis were three to one shots we'd expect them to win 25% of the Correct. time one in four but they're winning proportionally more than that and it's much more interesting than the bare stats i don't know what you mm. think kevin when you see you know x percentage of favorites of one race it's meaningless unless you know what price they were or, or what mm. they were racing it's kind of like everything it's context you need context and ae is a, is a far superior measure uh, of anything really than strike rates you yeah. can go, you can go deeper again of course but um, i think that that's very strong and it seems statistically significant you'd have to say yep by yeah. definition it's telling you that it's value if you've got a significant sample size and the ALV is much bigger than, than that's, that's a fair point because the, the, the raw statistic tells you something, mm. you know, but it, it's not telling you something that's interesting from a punting mm. point of view necessarily. Because yeah. we want to be ahead of the market. So there you go, Dubawi out punches his odds in those 10 and 12 furlong races at Asc Ascot. There will be more punting pointers later from Hugh Taylor, maybe from Kevin. I might have one or two up my sleeve as well. Who knows? Who knows? We're, we're going to move on though because we're, we're looking at uh, the grade ones first of all. And Royal Ascot day one starts with a kind of salvo, a volley of uh, terrific uh, Group One action. We'll kick off with the very first race, uh, race one, day one, which is the Queen Anne Stakes. And well, if, if you look at that, you, you, you're seeing a lot of horses that ran in the lockage at the, the front of the market, including Le Bravido. Um, then, then the horse that actually won the lockage, uh, Mustachery Lawrence, who was second, of course. Barney Roy wasn't there, but it's it, a whole unique story in his own right. We'll come to him. Zabil Prince, who, who, who won a group, his first group won, didn't he, the other day, um, comes into the picture as well. Accidental Agent, who we sometimes forget won <laughs> last year and is, is slightly overlooked at 12 to 1, 16 to 1, Lord Glitters, and has a 4 and 20 to 1, and bigger bar those. Who wants to kick me off with Le, Bra Le Bravido? I don't know where you stand on Le Bravido, Kevin. He was, he was very lukewarm in the market, mm. I think, at Newbury, wasn't he? And then and was a little bit fractious, I think it's fair to say. Some people say the race wasn't one to suit, but he he didn't hit the frame. So no, he's, how is he favourite? He's beaten four lengths. And look, Le Bravido, it's kind of the wise guy's case, but he's not a wise guy's price. You know, I think everyone saw the way he shaped. Everyone saw the way he shaped on his reappearance. His first start for Aidan O'Brien. You know, we know him best, I suppose, for winning the Jersey Stakes um, in defiance of an apparent track bias on the day a couple of years ago. Um, but you're, the market's assuming Aidan O'Brien's going to bring him forward. And look, there was plenty of promise in both his starts. There was plenty of promise in the lock -inch, but. He blew the start, as he did on his reappearance. Maybe not quite so bad, but still blew it. Didn't get a clear run 
and was, I think it still lasts maybe a furlong and a half from home and has finished that very well. So look, the promise is clear, but he's beaten four lengths. And, you know, the question, I suppose, headlining the Queen Anne is how highly do you rate the, the lock inch form? Because the, the front of the Queen Anne market is dominated by horses that competed in that. And if you're not so keen in that form, you know, you're, you're going to get fair value in opposing that form line if, if you wish to do so. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Uh, but, but let's stay on that lock inch theme for a moment, because um, historically that has been a good race to focus on when looking at this race. Yeah, and if, when you look at this race in advance, it, to me it does look the key race, and I, I think the winner probably will come for it. I think Barney Roy, you can make a case if he, I think he needs to come on another seven pounds. But um, the other thing about the Lockinch is of the five runners who we're expecting to turn up the first five home, certainly four of them you could argue ran eye catching races in one way or another. I mean, Mustachery, for instance. Um, I think he was about 16 to 1 chance for the Queen Anne going into the Lockinge. And if you stop the tape a furlong and a half out, he'd be at least that. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened in the final furlong was really, really impressive. There was no sign of it even until, you know, until just before the furlong pole. And he really took off. And that was, that was a clear step forward from him. So you can be very positive about him. Le Brevido was an old fashioned eye catcher, wasn't he? He had to be wait for, waited for a run, he had to be switched around. Finish might not have been in the best part of the track, not sure about that, but um, he finished well. In, in, and I think, um, I think his price probably reflects all of that and more now. And so. more, is it would, mm. would be my take personally. Yeah. I don't know what the time form figures tell mm. you, but I can't see what he's done to warrant being a clear favourite for this race. I mean, he's not a massively skinny favourite, but he is clear favourite ahead of mm. a horses who finished in front of him at Newbury, but a whole host of other horses. I think people are feeling the suspicion that Royal Ascot might have been the target all along. Yeah. Mm. That may be right, right, that may be wrong, but I think that's what people yeah, have interpreted. Other horses will step forward. Lawrence will step forward from her, right? Mm. Well, Lawrence, Lawrence was the kind of horse that... That's the kind of run that I really like yeah. when the horse is making its seasonal debut in that she tanked along, possibly did a little bit too much, really, was going just about best for a lot of the race, and ultimately she shaped like the run would probably bring her on, which... Although, say, if you compare with Accidental Agent, who I'm sure the run will also bring on, but it wasn't that kind of travel, 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 and then just got tired. So, um, yeah, Lawrence, I, I would have been very positive about, about that run in the normal circumstance thing. I've just, just got a slight doubt about whether her run style will be suited by Ascot, because she tends to be bang up okay. there. Mm -hmm. and I just wonder whether she might be there to be shot at in the closing so, stage. So we still like the Lockinge form. You do, Hugh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like I might struggle to pin you down to a Lockinge runner for this Every race. Every time I went through it yeah. and I was thinking positive things, I went back to another one. I was, yeah. you know, I was I see something slightly different, because Accidental Agent ran in the Lockinge last year yeah. before he went to and, and won the race. I do think the, the Queen Anne last year, if you, the front three in the market all failed to run anywhere near as well as you might have predicted. They were all well beaten and um, so it probably wasn't the strongest Queen Anne, but you can't crab what his, his Ascot record, you can't crab what he did in the Lockinge. Yep. It was a very promising run. If you like the Lockinge form, you have to back Romanize at 40 to 1, don't you? <laughs> Go he's, on. a, he's a wild prize. You know, he's finished ahead of Libervito. He's in amongst all of them. Yep. He's shaped maybe a little bit better than the bare form, not so much as others. He had to wait for a run as well. You know, he'd been very eye-catching on his reappearance too. And Ken Condon has come out and been quite bullish, you know, suspecting that he'll come forward. This is definitely his target. Um, and if he, you know, if all goes well between now and then and he gets there on the day, he surely won't be 40 to 1, will he? You couldn't. You couldn't allow him to go off that price. I, and my thought, my thought in it now, you know, you... You wonder, is he quite good enough to win? But you wouldn't be at all shocked if he runs on into a place Never at that sort of price. Of price. Never be scared of a price. You've made, you've made a case there. We must touch on Barney Roy because as, as, he's a kind of wild card here. He went mm. off to start, as people know, after a brilliant classic season. Um, this was his most recent start in France, and he, he kind of gets out of jail a bit here because it, it looked like it might go horribly wrong, this, mm. this race, but uh, he gets there. I was impressed with him, and like while Roman Eyes is kind of the wise guy selection for me, you know, this guy is probably my, my, my leading win prospect. You know, he had to wait an awful long time here, and he's shown a sharp turn of foot, and he's not necessarily a sharp turn of foot horse. You watch him there. The thing with Barney Roy, his strength was always his stride length. And as good as he was as a three-year-old, I don't think we ever saw the, the absolute maximum of Barney Roy. When they ran him over a mile, I, I felt they weren't riding him to best effect. They were riding him a little bit quietly to try and get him to settle. And then he went up to 10 furlongs, which he, which he's, which he, he stayed. But I don't think it was 
optimal for him. You know, I think if he, he's a gelding now, he seems a bit more settled. Uh, the Queen Anne, for me, would be the circumstances that could well show him the very best effect. We don't know if he is as good, but if he is close to being as good as he was, strongly run mile, straight track, stiff track, where he can be ridden reasonably prominently, use that stride, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to find out how much ability is still in there. And I'd be encouraged enough, um, particularly his most recent start, his, his reappearance was satisfactory. Yep. Perhaps mm -hmm. maybe not more than that, yep. but I, I just think the Queen Anne, if you were to set up a set of circumstances to find out exactly how good Barney Roy is, that I, I order that. that. That's what I put on, the, on my order. I would go to firm ground, please. Yes. You've hinted it, though, haven't you, that there is still a bit of unknown about mm. just how much ability he retains. He was miles better than the rest in that race, much, much better than yes. the bare result. What was that, Group 3, I think? That no, was a listed list, race. List. That's the point. It was a listed race. It wasn't that quality of opponent. Mm. And in a truly run race, it's very hard to say, would he have gone away and beaten them five or six lengths? I don't know. What I like, this is touched on Kevin's point, yeah, what's still there? Well, there was a gear change still there, because mm. he needed yep. that, that, that gap was quite brief. Mm. The other horse drifted out a bit, and he had to get in there, mm. and he did get in there, and then he went away and won, of course, uh, without actually a whole lot of the racetrack left in order to do that. So you thought, well, there's, there's still that ability to change gear and shift yeah. on, you know, uh, albeit, as you say, here against lesser yeah. opponents. Yeah. Is his price satisfactory, given those question marks? I think it's, it's not unreasonable. Yeah. I think it's not unreasonable. He would be, he would be the win selection. And, and just in terms of as a prep race, you know, I, I would consider that ideal. You know, we didn't, he wasn't shown to best effect, but he wouldn't have had a hard race. You'd imagine it filled him with confidence, you know, bringing a horse back from being at stud and being gelded, you know, it's a big ask. You know, historically it hasn't always worked out. In fact, it's probably not worked out more often than it has. Yeah. But in terms of a prep, in the circumstances, I think it's a, it's a really satisfactory prep. And if you were going to take a chance on Barney Roy being the horse he once was or close to it, I think uh, Tuesday week is the day to do it. Yep, and seven to one, fair enough. I'm with you on that. Uh, he'd, he'd narrowly be my pick. I, th I think Zabil Prince was possibly still a little bit underestimated given he has now proved himself at Group 1 level. But any, any, any other business on that one here for you? No, I thought I just wondered whether Zabil Prince was actually going to run in this yeah. or whether he's in one mile too far long as well. So True. that might be his trip more. Yeah. We've, we still don't know uh, exactly running plans mm. for all of those, but, but the, we're pretty sure Barney Roy's going for this. I think Charlie yeah. who's on record as yeah. saying that, yeah. isn't he? Uh, so, Tuesday, bang, 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 the Group 1's come, and uh, we've done one. Let's kick on now straight into the King's Stand a couple of races uh, later. And again, well, we've got a bit of blue on blue action here, haven't we? Batash and Blue Point. Batash in the hand there, so 7-4, 3-1, Blue Point uh, for Godolphin. Eight Mabs cross. Money today, I think, for Sergei Prokofiev. Mm. Interesting. I think I'm right in saying that I noticed that earlier on today. Invincible Army 10, 12 to 1. And in Primus there, we, we could have had Peter Fornatal, our American correspondent, on a little bit later as well. Mm -hmm. We might have some views on, on the American challenge. But let's, um, let's kick off here because we've got a bit of a rematch, uh, Kevin. What, what, what do you think? Uh, this is properly fascinating in terms of a race to, to get your analytical brain stuck into because Batash, look, on his day, probably as good a five furlong horse as, as we've seen in a couple of decades. I don't think that's yeah. an, an outlandish statement to make. In the race last year, things went wrong for him. Um, he went and tried to go straight for us. He, he led Lady Aurelia and Catchy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's not many horses on the planet that could do that. The two of them have gone that way. And to be fair to him, he's stuck on very well. And Blue Point, who got a, a dream run through, ha has nabbed him. You know, so I don't want to knock Batash for that. You know, and I think right. the horse is... It's maybe starting to come around in terms of not being so much of a hooligan and being a little bit more reliable, maybe. Speculating, hoping. He's because one of those, isn't he? When he's good, he's very, very good. Mm. His, his, best best bad, form, worst, his best form is... And if he runs to that best form, I really can't see him getting beaten. Mm. Um, and, he's, and he's not just got one standout performance, he's got two or three really, really very, very good performances. And it, it's interesting when you read that they say they're going to ride him that bit differently. Mm. I, I got the impression at Haydock on his comeback that that was the intentional. He ended up seeing plenty of Dale out as, as it was. And there were some fast horses there in that race. Um, and he was well within himself lying up with those fast horses. So if he can just get that bit of cover, if, if something gives him a lead, I do think he's going to be very hard to beat. What if that, that whole Royal Ascot and the blood and thunder of those sprints there is, is what's... 
I, wa I watched them. I followed them around last year. I watched them very, very closely. And he was good. He was good. The prelims weren't really an issue for him. Um, and look at just the way it was the way he was ridden. I think as much as anything. And I know there's probably only so much you can do with a horse that's as fast and as strong as Batash. But as Hugh says, if he can be two lengths off whatever's leading mm. at halfway, you know he, he'll take some whacking. You know because Blue Point really is a very good horse, and the the race will probably pan. It, well for him again but I think on their best days Batash wins every time doesn't he? It's interesting because you, uh, what I'm picking up from both of you is that to use a boxing term you know, pound for pound Batash is the better fighter he's the better horse on his day mm. in the right division in the right circumstances but then I look at Blue Point doing this and I think I'm not sure actually Blue Point is very very good as well isn't he? And what you'd say I suppose is the track is more in Blue Point's favour you know, on a speed favouring five furlongs, Patash, you know, that's where we've seen probably the very, very best of him, as well as he ran in the race last year. Yeah. You know, it's at Goodwood and places like that that we've perhaps seen the very best of him. So uh, in this, on this particular set of terrain, you know, probably gives Blue Point the best chance of, uh, of getting one up on him again. But I just, you know, and at, at the prices, I can see the case for Blue Point. If you wanted to take the chance on him, I'm not going to, to knock you for it. But... I think it, this, this wouldn't appeal as a big betting race for me, but just the, it's one of the more interesting races in terms of oh, fascinating. the narrative and if, everything if, else. If you watch the last couple of furlongs of last year's race, you think Batash must still win, and then Blue Point mm. picks him up later on. And when, and when you've seen that, you think, well, Blue Point will do the same again, because it's about Ascot, isn't it? It's about the strength of the race mm. and, and, and that finish. But that neglects all the points you've made about what happened in the first half of that race, mm. the, the fights that he was getting in and the fuel he was burning earlier on, and whether he can avoid that scenario. But I, I, I just wonder whether, even if he does, whether Blue Point might still finish mm. that Ascot five stronger than him. He's got a very good record at Ascot, mm. Blue Point. I, I, I wonder how easy a decision it was to go five rather than six this, this year rather than the, Golden Jub uh, the Diamond Jubilee, because um, I suppose it, when you've won the race and you're the, yep. the, you're the defending champ, it's yep. a logical place to come, but um, this might be a slightly hotter race of the two. Possibly, mm. I would say, you know, Definitely basically yeah. the race that Batash is in is the hotter race of the two. Is well, what I suppose is what what's saying. interesting is that we're talking about it as if it is a match race, and of course it isn't, because, no. you know, one's seven to four, one's three to one or seven to two, and there's there's a whole host of other horses mm. who are live mm. in it. So what what, are, what else is a player, Kevin? Well, you've got other horses that, that will be looking to pick up pieces. You know, yep. Mabs Cross, uh, Ser Sergei Prokofiev, you'd imagine they'll both be ridden quietly. You know, Mabs... A stiff five, a stiff five is what she wants with a rapid pace that softens itself up in front and lets her come through. You know, those are the circumstances she wants. But as well as the race panned out for her in that regard last year, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't quite get there. There's definitely an argument that she's better this season, based on her reappearance. But um, found it all happening a little bit too quickly behind Batash last time, and Sergey, I would take some convincing with him at this stage. At the price, he is definitely wouldn't be for me. Do you know when Aidan O'Brien's last? Five furlong group one winner is was or what it who it, who it was. I had to look this up. I must admit I didn't know this, but I thought I couldn't remember. Ooh. Nothing springs easily to mind, does it? Which I suppose non non two year old. I'm talking about oh, older three year old. Okay, plus. go on. Last one was Mozart. My God, two thousand and one. <laughs> um, if you, if you look at his record of group one, you know a fabulous record, yeah. but the vast majority of them are a mile plus. There's a handful at six. He's had some yeah. very good six mm. furlong horses, yeah. um, some top class ones. But and, and it's understandable when you see the pedigrees of the Coolmore yeah. horses yeah. That, that, that you know the top ones have all been Milers or you know Galileo or sons of Galileo. And uh, so that's the, that's the one area where his horses might be overbet on the name of the trainer and the, and the colours, and the record doesn't really back it up. That's all I'm saying. Fair point. Okay. Final word on the King's Stand. Um, a race to, to savour and enjoy rather than get heavily stuck in, but, but, but Patash, for all that, it maybe isn't an ideal track for him. I, I'd be hoping he'd get the job done. Just a quick word about the Australian mayor, who's, yes. who's very quick from the stalls, mm. might lead, which might help Patash. Mm. Um, Kerry McAvoy's coming over to ride, ride and I, Is I, he? I had a quick uh, asked, asked him about her and he said... With your old mucker? Cause you my, yeah, my... Yeah, when he was over here. Um, yeah it's, it's great that he's coming back over. He says she's, you know, she's a very fast mare. He likes the fact that she's coming into it fresh. Um, she's been over here three months, so she's had plenty of time to acclimatise. He thinks, okay. the fa you know, five furlongs will be ideal for her. I'm not sure that her form 
I mean, the Aussies haven't sent as many sprinters over lately, have they? It's, no. It's no, dried up a little bit from the, yeah. the glory days of a few years ago. But um, she doesn't, to me, I don't really know the form inside that. She doesn't, to me, have that really strong look that some of the old Australian she, sprinters... She was used. another one who was on my radar when I was doing a bit of looking at markets this morning because... She is a bit of a positive, and, and one or two people are having a little nibble. Well, if you, there's one of the races... I, I had a quick look at one of her races on YouTube, and she was like lightning. She was drawn widest around a bend, obviously in a very different scenario, yeah. but she got right across in front of a big field and was and led them a merry dance. Mm. It was, it was well, quite Well, gate impressive. speed must never be underestimated, mm. yeah, mm, even yeah. at the, the stiff track of it. I what? suspect she might be in front two furlongs out. Yeah. I don't know any more than that. Well, well it'll, it'll be fascinating yeah. to see her in the parade ring beforehand, because we saw with, with Black Caviar when she came over, you know, there are severe severe challenges for mares coming from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere at this time of year. You know, Black Caviar looked terrible in her coat. She didn't know whether she was coming or going. So I believe Hootsen has been here for, for a good while already. Yeah, three months. Yeah, three yeah. months. So it'll be interesting to see how she looks, if her coat, if she's... Hell, if she's if she looks like she should, Hopefully you know, in, in Northern Hemisphere in summer, yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I can only imagine they'll have her under heat lamps and everything else. Well, to, to be fair, her. though, we've had some good warm weather, you know, by our standards, yeah. in, in you know, and uh, she's been here for all of that. Well, mm. you know, a good late spring and early summer, so we will see. And in terms of her own pace, you know, uh, soldiers, soldiers call, he's a rapid horse himself, isn't he? Mm. So. You'd hope if you're if you're a Batash fan, you, you you're hoping that pace is drawn relatively close to him, and, and draw will be crucial, I think, in that regard. This is a fairly mature market in terms of odds now because the sure. announced post prices. But it is one thing to look at when the final declarations are made, where the pace is and how much pace is and where the Absolutely. horses are drawn around. That is the that will be the final piece in the jigsaw. I'm thinking I might back this Hunson mare from Australia and we might be laying her off at uh, you know, a, a right. fifth of her price with two furlongs to go when she's still a couple of lengths clear with her, her lightning. Mind you, she'd have to be very quick when she's to still be in front at, at that stage. We must move on. Uh, St James's Palace stakes the third of the Group 1s uh, on day one. And, um, well, Phoenix of Spain came out and won a guineas uh, at the first time of asking a six to four favour on the back of it. Too darn hot. Some people will still carry the torch, seven to two. Um, Magna Grecia. Six to one. Could make a case for that being a big price for a classic winner, couldn't you, Kevin? I suppose. And uh, King Comedy seven to one, twelve to one. Scardu, who's running uh, a, a couple of the classics already. Shaman from France fourteen, Mad Moon fourteen, sixteen to one. San Donato twenty to one and bigger. But those. Where, well, where should we start, Kevin? Irish two thousand guineas. Yeah. As good a place as any. Um, Phoenix of Spain, you know, who had finished behind. Magna Grecia and Two Darren Hot, both of them last year, on days where we may, we suspected we didn't see the very best of Magna Grecia and Two Darren Hot, but physically, big scopey coat, and I think what was just as important in the Irish Theatre House Guineas, as well as being produced in great shape, they rode him differently. They rode him much more forwardly, made the running in the Race and Post Trophy, they'd ridden him quite quietly. And it, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe that just didn't show him the best effect. One proviso, and look, on that form, on the Irish 2000 Guineas form, he was very powerful in the final furlong. It, it's difficult to make a case for the other two to reverse the form unless you're very forgiving of what they did on the day. But one little proviso I'd give is, I think five out of the seven winners that day at the Curra either made all or sat a very close second. There was a very strong feeling from many of the participants on the day that for whatever reason, there was a pace bias towards those that were very prominent. There was a tailwind, and it, it's and it was much the same even on one thousand guineas day. Maybe not quite so pronounced, but those that were up on the very front end seemed to be faring much better than one would have, would have expected them to. So that's a slight proviso, but you know you would have to be hopeful that he'd come forward again, and you know he, he'll take whacking. He'll take whacking, uh, but it might just be one of those to, to have a little skirt around and try and find something at a, at a bigger price. Well, it, it depends, you, you know, because on, on the face of it, as, as Kevin has said, unless you think there was something about the way the race ran, and, and Kevin's touched on, maybe there was, but maybe there was a pace bias, maybe there was something about um, you know, the conditions on that day, but on the bare form as it sits in black and white on the page, there's no reason why they should beat him, is there? The, the horses who were behind him in Ireland. Yeah, he, he didn't just scramble home, did he? No, no, no. He, he won you know, by quite a wide margin. I, 
I was looking at my tracker this morning and I've, he's still in my tracker with the comments, something along the lines, because he, he ran a really eye-catching race at Wolverhampton in my tracker. He said something like, <laughs> interesting if he returns to the all-weather. You know, I think I'll be waiting a long time for that to happen now. But um, no, no we, I, that was... Console one, yourself, Hugh, you're a very good judge. You the spotted one, his potential. <laughs> <laughs> the one... Um, the one thing I would say is that, to me, that was a big leap forward, whether it was the way he was ridden. It was a big leap forward on the very good form he showed. That's why it does leave you with that lingering doubt, doesn't it? Well, mm -hmm. maybe, the, maybe he's fluked this somehow. Mm -hmm. But um, as a two-year-old, he, he, was he wasn't far off these horses. He was right on top of Magna Grisha yeah. in the race and post, to be yeah. fair, and things didn't go perfectly for him. I suppose, look, the case, you can, you can make a case for two Darren Hart and Magna Grisha being able to bounce back from the Curra. You know, two Darren Hart had a far from ideal preparation, was coming back quickly after the Dante. Magna Grisha subsequently has turned up that he had a bit of a hamstring twinge mm. that uh, only emerged when he went back into his canters. So there, there's little reasons. Well, you know, it, it feels like you're grasping a little bit in hope because like, like we've said, you know, Felix of Spain whomped him. You know, he bolted up. He, he was he very, very strong. But you, you, you've laid out a few potential doubts if somebody wants to take him on, and he's a short enough price that you could take him on either you just lay him if you want to mm. um, but you said maybe maybe we look for something at a price give us something at a bigger price beyond beyond the obvious sort of trio at the front there well i don't know if he's a certain runner but i have another son of luke de vega that took a big step forward and a seasonal reappearance in a classic and that seems to be totally um out of the mix here for manny sandonato okay um, good two-year-old, over six furlongs, looked very promising on a number of occasions and uh, made his return in the French 2000 guineas on ground that was maybe softer than ideal for him. And you'll see him here, you know, he'd never run beyond, he'd only run beyond six once. He looked perhaps a sprinter in the making last season. Mm. They've ridden him conservatively with a view to getting the trip and uh, he's finished off very well here for me. Um, it's a French mile, though, Kev. It's not a real mile. It's a French mile. <laughs> well, you know, we, we see we see Persian King in the far side, who you know is a horse that, that's very ten. he's very highly <laughs> regarded in, in this neck of the woods. But I, I thought this was a good run. I mean, he's running through the line. I think with the benefit uh, of this run under him, they'd ride him maybe a small bit more positively yeah. at Ascot. He could go for the jersey. Yeah, uh, mm. he'd be a big player in the jersey if he went there, but. If he's mine, I nearly have a go at this, you know. I nearly have a go at and this. You know I thought what? that was very I, promising. He, he's not going to be shorter if, if we know he lines up. He's not going to mm. be massively shorter if he lines up in this, because I think people will overlook. Yeah, and powerful. sometimes we see that. It's a bit of a phenomenon. When these horses go to France, they don't tend to get the respect they deserve when they yeah. come back. Yeah. You know, we saw it with Lawrence last season, yeah. and uh, I thought that was a great run. It was a run that, it was, if you knew him well as a two-year-old, you couldn't be but delighted with that because as a two-year-old, he looked like one that kind of might teeter on the edge of going the wrong way in terms of being too free. But the way he settled there was, was very encouraging for me. I thought he was actually still plenty keen enough on the ground and up in trip. Yeah. I thought it was a tremendous run. I really did. You know, I'm not saying I, I necessarily think he's better than some of the ones that had in the market, but um, I would say that there's been a few horses from... Roger Varian's yard, the real prince who we've already mentioned, yeah. who've taken big leaps forward this True. year. Yeah, um, the stable's been, form, uh, yeah. you know, there's been horses running better than they've, they've done before, and mm. um, he might be one of them. And that was, you know, that was very, very encouraging. I just have a slight doubt whether a stiff mile, um, he will need to settle, put it that way. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure I would ride him that positively. I'd want to, I'd want, I'd want him to settle. I'd, I'm not sure I'd want to get him too fired up myself, yeah. because um, I thought. There was a little bit of a sign of a turn of foot there, but I just thought he was on the ground, he was keen enough, and uh, if they go a gallop and he can settle, then he could be a player, definitely. But wherever he turns up, we need to perhaps respect him a bit more than the market has so mm. far. I think so, Is definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. OK, so but, but San Donato at a, at a big old prize. Otherwise, we think Phoenix of Spain probably we ought takes to mention, an awful lot of beating. We ought to mention King of Comedy. Yes. Who's... Yes. Um, a bit quirky, a bit mm. enigmatic. Uh, he's got a high head carriage, a um, bit awkward going down to the start, but he's got a ton of ability, and if anybody can keep the lid on him, it's John Gosden. And he's, um, yeah, I, I thought he was very impressive at Sandown. Uh, I think he's, I don't think he's overpriced. If he was a double figure price, if he was 10 to 1, 12 to 1, something like that, I think he'd be one that, you know, I might be interested in taking the chances that come with him because he could go the wrong way, that, yeah. that horse. He definitely could. But as I say, he's in the right hands and um, 
he ran very well. At, I think it was Yarmouth, wasn't it, before that? And then, then so he, he looks to be going the right way despite his quirks. Good. Fair, fair, fair analysis. Great name as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for film buffs, uh, amongst others. Now, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by another uh, member of the At The Races.com family, a man who's been pulling up trees in terms of his big race analysis this year. Simon Rowlands is on the phone. Welcome, Simon. Hello there. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm... Many people listening will think, I want Simon's analysis of all the big races. I presume you will be getting stuck in day by day during Royal Ascot. That's true, yep. Uh, doing a daily preview uh, and some recommendations along the way for uh, at the races uh, on a daily basis. Excellent. Look forward to reading those because uh, you've been in fine form. I know that you have had a look, though, Simon, at the two-year-olds uh, from both sides of the pond uh, in terms of uh, who's been doing what so far. That, I mean, there are a lot of two-year-old races to talk about, so maybe, maybe kick us off with where you think the strongest performances are likely to come or, what, or which, which races you're most looking forward to. Yeah, um, normally the answer to that would be the Coventry Stakes, and whilst I think it clearly is a race to look forward to, I don't think... But it is necessarily quite as outstanding as it has been in recent years where we've had uh, Calix winning the Coventry last year and after a sensational debut, um, Caravaggio and Dawn approach in the recent past. Coventry Stakes itself doesn't look quite as strong at this stage, but the point of the Coventry Stakes is to identify those horses who, who will go on to be really good. So um, it remains to be played for there. I think the Queen Mary stakes, even in the absence of Lady Pauline, who was pulled out at the weekend due to a setback, is uh, potentially um, one of the best renewals of that race. Um, and we've had winners like Lady Aurelia and Acapulco in the recent past. Um, so I think that really does promise to be very good. Um, there's no such thing as a bad two-year-old race at Royal Ascot, though. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Who's, who's, you mentioned Lady Pauline's uh, uh, not there, but he's got Kimari in mm -hmm. there, Wesley Ward. Who else stands out in the Queen Mary? Well, I do actually think Kimari has got pretty strong claims. Um, I can't profess to know a huge amount about her, other than that in a one race to date, she ran a really fast time, uh, one by 15 lengths, and the, the filly that she beat in that race went and won at the weekend at Churchill Downs. Um, I think there's every chance that Kamari's a really good filly, but there's every chance she's going to need to be uh, because over here we've got notably Chasing Dreams and Final Song who have got engagements elsewhere at Royal Ascot but seem most likely to run in the Queen Mary on Wednesday. Uh, they both won their only starts, both owned by Godolphin. Chasing Dreams beat uh, Good Vibes uh, pretty easily by five lengths at Newmarket. Um, and Good Vibes as a listed winner since then. Final song ran really fast, closing splits, as far as we could tell, at Ascot, when winning by a very long-looking uh, five lengths there on her only start. Um, I don't have a great deal between the three of them on my figures, but um, have had a bit of a nibble at Kamari after I learnt of the Lady Pauline news. <laughs> No flies on you, uh, Kamari, for, for Wesley. Well, of the Godolphin pair there, Simon, Chasing Dreams, Charlie Appleby, final song, Saeed Bin Sarur. Is, is, is there anything between them? Can you, can you split the pair of them? Uh, I don't have much between them. I, I think the fact that Chasing Dreams beats two next-time winners um, and in good vibes, um, a filly who went on to win at a listed race, um, does suggest that her... Well, there's absolutely no doubt that Chasing Dreams' debut form only run so far, win at Newmarket, is really strong. Um, and I suppose there's a little bit more of a doubt about what final song actually beats. Um, so I'd imagine Chasing Dreams might be the best of the home contingent. But the three of the fillies that I've mentioned there, the, the one from America, Kamari, and the two from over here, are, are all up to the usual standard, um, by usual standard, I mean, the kind of standard that when we don't get an Acapulco or a Lady Aurelia, um, which, who knows, maybe one of these could be in that kind of calibre. In, in terms of what we've seen, actually, Simon, so far from the States, because we, we've seen a few Wesley Ward two-year-olds come out and win by what looked like wide margins, looked pretty <laughs> impressive in the States. In terms of what they're actually doing on the clock, though, is, is, is he bringing any potential superstars over as far as you can see? Um... 
Yeah, uh, one of the other fillies that he's and he's particularly good with fillies. Let's face it, uh, is a filly who I've also had a nibble at, who'll probably be in a rather easier race to win, which is the Albany Stakes on Friday. Is a Wesley Ward filly called Nai Beth, um, who ran over a second quicker than her stable companion Chili Petan, who's actually favourite or joint favourite for I think the Windsor Castle Stakes earlier in the week. Uh, so she ran, you know, many pounds quicker um, at Kingland in April when they both ran. And um, the filly that Naya Beth beat uh, was a pretty good winner at Woodbine more recently. And there was a large margin, something like 10 lengths, I think, back to the remainder. It looks really good on paper for Naya Beth. Um, she doesn't have anything obviously quite as good as Final Song and chase, Chasing Dreams against her, assuming that they go for the Queen Mary rather than for this race. Um, but she does, Nayabeth, have uh, Nadine O'Brien once raced, once winning, Group three, 3 winning, no less, uh, Philly in Etoile, who won at Nace uh, fairly recently, clearly a good prospect, um, but she hasn't achieved as much on the clock as Nayabeth so far. OK, so Nair Beth there for the Albany. Give us one more, if you can, Simon, before we have to let you go. Yeah, um, I think um, bomb-proof uh, from over here. Uh, Jeremy Nizida trained. He announced his re imminent retirement recently. Bomb-proof uh, beat a host of next-time winners uh, at York on his only appearance so far. Ran really fast closing splits, 33 and change for the last three furlongs. And looks the business. The form's strong. He's very speedy. And he, certainly amongst the um, American contingent, he doesn't look to have all that much to beat. It's probably, there'll probably be something better from nearer to home. Good stuff. Nice uh, way to bring down the curtain on Jeremy Nazida's career, wouldn't it? Uh, bomb proof in the Windsor Castle. It's brilliant stuff, uh, Simon. Many thanks for joining us with that two year old analysis. And look forward to reading all your thoughts day by day during the week. Thank you very much. Simon Rowlands there, who uh, is uh, such a big contributor to the At The Races website. He's, he's been in good form, hasn't he? Oh, he's, he's been banging them in. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, he's, he's had a far better year than me, that's for sure. Oh, he's no, been... no, well, he's, you're, he's... you're tipping in, in, in races every day, which takes some doing. Yeah, but to be fair, he has he has been in outstanding form. No, he's, he's been, been doing he's very been well. doing some great picks, yeah. You need to find some, some winners. In your, in your, I, know, I know you're there to give opinions. In your, you, know, you need to find some winners to keep up with these boys. <laughs> oh, big time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopeless task there, it is. Ah, no, you, you'll find a few, I'm sure, for us. Let's, let's move on. We, we move on to day two, to the Wednesday, and the feature race, may, maybe the feature race of the week, uh, in many yes. people's view. <laughs> yes, uh, no hesitation from you. Yes, mm. it is simply the race of the week. Uh, sea of Class... Coulda, woulda, shoulda, been an art winner. We'll, who knows? Two to one, three to one, magical. Crystal Ocean, five to one. Massa, the Derby winner. I haven't seen him since six to one. Valdegeist uh, from France, seven to one. Seven to one, Old Persian. Seven to one, Gayath. Twelve to one, thun double figures. Thunder Snake. That will come with it. But anyway, um, two to one, the field here for the Princess Wales Stakes, starting with Sea of Class. How exciting to see her here. What, what can we expect from her? Do you think? Well. Who knows, because it's a seasonal debut. She missed her intended uh, reappearance in the Middleton States. Doesn't sound like a, a major problem. Um, I think most people would say she was probably unlucky not to win the art. The sectional certainly suggests that. The, the vi visually watching the race and the run she got through, she was gaining on, uh, on the winner all the, all the way to the line. Yeah. Um, this is, a, you know, you couldn't have found a much more competitive, if, assuming most or a lot of the principals stand their ground. They don't all need to stand their ground for this to still be, in my view, the race of the week. There's 13 Group 1 winners in the, in the entries at the moment. Um, and um, she, it, it's one mile, two furlongs. Will she? The, the question I've got, I'm not definitely not going to have a bet in this race. I'm looking forward to it immensely, but um, there's so many plots and subplots and... In, in, never in, say never, something might... Well, may, maybe, absolutely, day, never say never. The prices might surprise me on the yeah. day, so, but I, I'll be surprised if I have a bet. Sure. Um, but if, if there is an angle into the race, I'd, when I was looking through it, my thought was how many of these horses, really good horses though they are, would be running over one mile four furlongs if the, if the Hardwick was group one, mm -hmm. as opposed to a group two, because a lot of these, I would say, a lot of the good horses in this are at least as good at one mile four furlongs sure. as they are at two, and, yeah. and the favourite included, I would say. Yeah. 
No, that's probably fair. Um, staying with the Phillies for a minute, what about Magical? Uh, she's the bet in the race, isn't she, right now? It wouldn't be a shock to me if Sea of Class and maybe a couple of the others don't turn up. Um, she's done nothing wrong this season. People will throw stones at her because she's beaten the same horse over and over, but she's beating him very well. And um, we see her here giving an able a right old race of it out in America at the back end. She seemed to improve for stepping up to a mile and a half at the back end of last season, and I suppose many of us expected her to be campaigned over that trip this season. I assume that will come later in the campaign, but she's been very good over the, the mile and the quarter so far. And um, you know, she's had a clear run at it this year. She had a setback in the middle of last season and just put her on the back foot. We know Aidan O'Brien's team wasn't 100% at different points at the campaign. So I think it's, and I think it, in terms of official figures, she's improved this season and she's shown that she's improved from three to four, which is something that Sea of Class will have to prove. Yep. Um, you know, in the arc, which we saw, you know, she's getting seven pounds weighed for age. She's a filly that showed some quirks earlier in her life. You know, we don't, we, she gives the impression of being a very pacey filly, but she has to prove she can do it over 10 furlongs. So that's a couple of big question marks for me next to her. And whereas Magical has, has no such question marks in, in my mind. She's being aimed at the race. The ground will be no problem. Um, she may, or may not win the race, but I d certainly think she won't be any bigger than the price she is now. She'll only get shorter if she moves at all. And um, she just looks a, a very solid prospect to me in the race. I had a look on Betfair this morning and she was the stronger of the two. I don't know whether that reflects market sentiment or whether people perhaps aren't completely convinced that Sea Class is going to turn up. I'm no reason to believe she isn't, but um, yeah, I, I can't argue with anything Kevin said about, um, you know, that's, it all makes sense. And she, she produced quite a good time figure. And if you, if you add up the sectional as well to it, she, you know, she's been meeting flag of honour repeatedly yep. this year, but the time was good last time. So, yeah, I think all in all, she's very, very solid, definitely. And if you like Sea of Class, if you like Magical, you must like Val, guys, mustn't you? On, 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 on a variety of form lines. We talked about underestimating the French form, and uh, he's come out and shown he's as good as ever. Can he travel? Is it five times? Is, is it five? No, no. Is it oh. five times he, he's run outside of France? And he's right. got he's got whacked every oh, time. Yeah. Maybe there's something in it. Maybe there isn't. But he certainly looked very good here, um, in terms of the visuals and everything else. And it was encouraging to see him do it over the trip, given that yeah. we'd mostly seen him over a mile and a half in his life. So on, if he if he turns up in this shape, you know, absolutely, you can definitely make the case he's overpriced. But I just I do wonder about him on his travels. Like I say, it may, might be something in it, may yeah, not be, well, but it it's, can be, can't it's it? something. Until he does it, he has to go and prove it. He's, yeah. fa he's failed a number of times okay, now. I'll give so. you another one. <laughs> Derby winner. Massa. And there's another one who you say, well, he's a mile and a half horse now, mm -hmm. isn't he? But before the Derby, everyone thought he was a mile and a quarter mm -hmm. horse, and it's classic form. How far do you win the Craven by as well? He was a very, you know, he's not a slow horse, but well, no. slow horses don't win derbies, but no. he's not your archetypical mile and a half horse. It's just a question that we haven't seen him for so yes. long. And, and this really is being thrown in, back in at the very deep end, isn't it? And uh, I wouldn't be backing him myself, given what a stiff t stiff task. But it's fascinating to see him back. I, you know, if, if, he, if he runs, it'll be it'll just add that extra dimension to the race, won't it? Somebody is going to be a long way ahead, potentially, after two days here in terms of success because we've touched on a few good old and Appleby horses largely mm. uh, Massar, Barney Roy, uh, Blue Point and, and, and Aidan O'Brien could have a few in the bag by now as well but uh, I, I, every, every day that I look at I, I keep finding a Charlie Appleby good old horse I keep thinking well that could go well that, that, that's a big player and it looks like they've all been assembled like he's, he's, he's putting all this gunpowder in one barrel which is Royal Ascot mm. and it could go horribly wrong but if it, if it all comes together they could the Royal, Royal Ascot is massively important to the Mac Toon family. Right. And, um, uh, oh, it's over the last couple of years, really, he's taken this huge stride forward, hasn't it, into being absolutely a top echelon trainer. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, yeah he's going to go there with a, a massive ammunition. And I'll be surprised if he doesn't come up with a few winners. Yeah. You're right. And it's very healthy for the game, too. You know, mm. we need that rivalry to be really hotly contested. I think that's in everyone's interest. Everyone, everyone every neutrals interest for, for that yeah. to be the way it pans out and it's need, shaping up that way. You need both teams to to be firing on all mm. cylinders as well because sometimes it doesn't happen and somebody's 
string is off colour and the other one isn't, and, and, and so on. But if they're both on fire, mm. there's going to be real fireworks. Mm. I think. It's, it, it, betting wise, I mean, Aidan O'Brien's an odds on favourite, Ryan Moore's an odds on favourite to be top jockey, Aidan's odds on favourite to be top, uh, top trainer. But I, 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 I could see Charlie Appleby having. A lot of he's eight to one to be top trainer. Is this Boyce's first first punting angle? <laughs> well, I, I think the prices are wrong, I, I wouldn't be rushing to back Ryan Moore at odds on. He's five to two with Hills, five to two to to, to match his record of nine winners in the meeting. He could do it, obviously, because mm. they've got I don't know how many favourites, eight or nine favourites probably already, and he'll ride I, I guess quite a lot of them. Well, you, you couldn't say he's coming into the meeting now at the at the height of his powers. I think it's fair to say. Well, if if, if jockeys are. Uh, you know, like all sportsmen and women are, are confidence-driven, and he's, an ex he's a supremely confident man who has great faith in his own ability, I guess, uh, Ryan Moore. But you're right, it, it, you know, it hasn't been plain sailing, has it? No, oh, well, he had two Group 1 winners there in Irish Guineas weekend, and those were his first Group 1s since the previous October. You know, and I know he wouldn't traditionally ride a load of Group 1 winners during the winter and uh, early parts of the season, but he tended to over the years. Mm. It was his longest Group 1 drought, I think, in, in six years or something like that. And just things haven't been going ideally for him. He, he's, he's, he's getting beat when Aidan O'Brien is winning the race, you know, and it, it just, he's human. Yes. And uh, as cool and as even-tempered a man as, as he's proven to be, mm. you know, you'd have to be made of, of, of concrete, really, for, for, that, <laughs> for a series of things like that, not to just creep in a little bit. But, you know, it, it would be typical Ryan if he, if he burst out of Royal Ascot and really set such doubts aside. But it's, it's a little variable to it's have in your mind, we, I think. We, we had a nice uh, feature going out on Sky Sports with uh, Jason. We were chatting with... Um, Frankie Dettori, who's had, I think, 60, 60 um, Royal Ascot winners, and what would, what would be a good week for you? So if, uh, probably uh, you'd want five. You know, you'd want five. And I thought, well, I mean, you know, most people would say, well, you know, I'd be delighted to ride one. You know, yeah. any, any Royal Ascot winners, not five. I want four. You know, that, that would be a good week. Could be, yeah, you know. that's, that's what makes Frankie. You know, he walks into the likes of Ascot, and he, he, the chest comes out, and he grows, and he loves it. He embraces all the pressure, all the expectation. As a sportsman, he grows with, with the occasion. Yeah. You know, and it's not the same for every top jockey. It's like an actor, you want the big stage, don't you? You don't mm. want just one line. You want, to be, you want to be playing a part Absolutely. all the way through. Yeah. Well, they all do, I'm sure. But yeah, some, some people can rise, can't they? And, and, and rise to that occasion. And, and Gold Cup is the centrepiece for many people of the Royal Meeting. And uh, Stradivarius will be a very short price favourite for Frankie. 11 to 8, cross counter there on 5 to 1. Another Godolphin horse, cross counter 5 to 1. Q Gardens. Five to one. DXB. What an interesting horse he is this year as a as a cup horse. Eleven to two. Southern France twelve. Flag of Honor fourteen. Capri and Magic Circle both in there on sixteen to one. Twenty to one. By those, I suppose we have to start with uh, Stradivarius. Is there any reason why he wouldn't go and do it again? Is the competition stronger this year potentially here? That's that's the issue, isn't it? Because for all that stayers tend to stay around for a long time and and quite often you end up, end up meeting the same small yep. group. This is a completely different set of rivals yeah. that he's facing to yeah. last year, including some who are still quite hard to assess because they're either completely untested at the trip. In fact, most of his likely strongest rivals haven't raced no, over well, two Nobody gets to run over no. two and a half miles. There's not that many races. Yeah. And, and, but also a lot of them haven't had that many goes. And the yep. you know, DXB's raced twice. And um, I didn't think he's the first race at Ascot was particularly a strong race, he can only win it, but he yes. wasn't a strong race. But I was quite impressed with him at Ascot, in particular the finish. Um, so I backed Austrian school to beat him that yeah. day, and um, I thought I had a chance two furlongs out, and it wasn't close at the line. So, uh, yeah, that's the key. That's the question. He's got some up-and-coming young rivals who um, are still hard to assess, might still have further progress in them. Um, he just wins, though, doesn't he? He doesn't... I mean, his last five wins have all come by a length and a half or less. But he's got the winning habit, yes. and he's trained by a trainer who, you know, and especially when you watch the, the, that comeback run in the Yorkshire Cup, that's screamed all over that he's going to go forward, he's going to mm, yes. go the right way from he's it. Quite didn't weak he? in the market that day, wasn't he? Yeah, he yeah. was, and the way he came through, and the front two pulled clear. I, I just can't see him going backwards from that. No. So. Um, I think he will set a stiff standard. Yeah, I think that's fair. And Frankie Dettori will get out of whatever trouble he's in, <laughs> if necessary, and take no prisoners, as we know. What about the Irish Challenge, Kevin? Because that could be strong. I, I, I don't know who it will feature, though, particularly. I, I got the impression with Aidan O'Brien all season that Capri is his Gold Cup horse, but he's been terribly disappointing twice now. Um, you know, Aidan has emphasised that he's a big, gross horse that's probably even even worse in that regard this season than before. But, it, God, he... 
He hasn't looked like a horse that's loving it to me this season. You know, if Aidan O'Brien can get him to compete in the Gold Cup, that's some trainer performance. You know, personally, I had him in mind as the one that would put it up to Stradivarius before we saw him this season. I, I've always felt he'd, he'd really relish, you know, the, the tests that staying races present. Um, but I've kind of gone off the scent a little bit, <laughs> um, especially after last time. I was particularly disappointed with him there. So, um, But after that, even after that, Aidan O'Brien has still said, Gold Cup, Gold Cup. So... He seems to be retaining the fate. You know, he has other candidates there. You know, Q Gardens would have been the one that Manny would have had in yeah, mind going into exactly. this season. Yeah. But they seem keen to keep him at shorter trips. Okay. Southern France was kind of the sneaky one that could improve into a Gold Cup horse. But after he ran so well behind Stradivarius, that there was talk that he might drop in trip. You know, he's a really interesting horse. He's, he's massive. Mm. Physically, he's huge. And I remember going into Royal Ascot last year, he was... And be, he was being touted for the, the Queen's Vase and you know, Aidan O'Brien was putting the view forward that you know, I, I'm very concerned that he's too much of a baby for Royal Ascot at this stage and in many ways he shaped that way and for the rest of the season even he just seemed a work in progress but you know, he travelled better in Stradivarius and has come back he looks like a horse that has improved as you would have hoped from three to four mm -hmm. so if he turned up you know, he'd have to be interesting but the chat of going back in trip has kind of thrown yeah. everyone thrown everyone off a little bit. So, what, what you were saying there about Capri is interesting because you, what, what you're hearing, what you're picking up and, and sensing is that actually Aidan O'Brien Aiden Brown wants to persist mm. as a cup horse. And what I hear when you say that is, well, we should pay attention because usually he's right in the end, even if it takes a few goes. Yeah, that's it. Because like. Like if, uh, for me, you know, I, I gave up in my mind as a, a, yep. a, as a potential Gold Cup winner after last time. But again, you, he's persisting, he's persisting and he believes that he's a Gold Cup horse. And like you say, you, you have to respect it because he, he's been there and done it numerous times. Yeah, and he'll be seeing something that is not apparent to us on the outside. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. mm. that so somehow he might get there. Um, you, you touched on DXB. Um, as things stand now, would he would he be a potential play for you against the fav this favourite is going to make the market for us? Um, I don't think I would back him at his current price, no. Um, I, I think I might marginally prefer cross-counter, but okay. um, I'm, I, th I think they've both got a potential and I think they've both still got they both still need to improve again. Cross counter in the in the Melbourne Cup, I was really impressed by. He had a lot of ground to mm. make up because he had a he had a tricky draw and he was he got a long way back and then Kerry had to come very wide. And every time I watch it, I think he can't win. Yeah. And this is in Dubai, isn't yeah. it? On his on his reappearance, yeah. and uh, uh, I suppose you could argue this was um, I wouldn't say it was workmanlike because he's he's convincing enough in the end, and it's um, it's his first run back, and he's on he's well on top of the line. Um, he's not certain to stay two mile four fields. I mean, he broke the track record at Goodwood when he had DXB well behind. Yes. Yeah. Um, DXB all through last year looked like a one paced horse who was going to improve for a trip. So I might I, I keep changing my mind between those two. I've said to you it's just really... now, I slightly prefer cross county. If you'd asked me yesterday, I might have said the other way around. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It's... I'm, I'm always in the same camp, but the other way around. I was I was quite keen on cross county. I read, read Mark Johnson's comments today about how actually. You know, after his derby performance, they, they kind of had to attempt to win a 10 or 12 furlong Group 1 um, for, for standing reasons. But what he was itching to do was turn him into a cup horse. And mm. he was waiting for yeah. permission to do that. And now he has mm. that permission. And he's, he's won the right couple of races en route, hasn't he? Mm. Those, the, those are the races you'd want to win to come here. Mm. Um, so now, now I'm leaning towards DXB. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's a cross counter. Another, another good Olfin player in there at a price. Well, if, if you wanted a sneaky one that's not on the caption Go on. at all there, it was um, a sneaky Blakey. Falcon 8. Dermot Weld, um, there, I, I read a little piece on the plane on the way over that they're considering it. It's very much in the mix for them. They, he's not a certain runner yet, but he, I think he's 25 to 1 or something like that. And he's, if, if you look back at his races, he's remarkable, really. He just gets a long way back and flies home. Um, you know, probably a mix of him being a bit of a baby as well as being a very strong stayer. And, you know, two and a half miles is an, is an extreme test, and it would always be hard to be bullish about a horse taking on that test for the first time, but he, he looks like one you could, you could imagine, you could imagine him getting outpaced in a Gold Cup and flying home. You know, he's just that type. And if Dermot Weld and the Moyglare team did decide, right, we'll let him take his chance, I would take that as, as great encouragement. Absolutely. They don't mess about, do they? So if, if he turns up, there's one at a price there, you see. 
always winkle one out for us, which is uh, what you're here for, Kevin. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on. We've got more Group 1s to cover, and time is ticking on the Commonwealth Cup. Uh, we move forward to the Friday here. Ten sovereigns, seven to four. Seven to one, Lady Kea, Jash, uh, seven to one. Hello, Yumzane on eight, ten to one, and bigger uh, bar those. Um, kick us off with a ten sovereigns case, Kevin. Are you, are you a, a fan or not? I'm a fan. Um, very good two-year-old. Looked to be kind of learning the job as he went. He kind of seemed to win his first two starts through raw ability. And then he had to do a little bit more in the middle park and, and be a bit more of a, a racehorse rather than a, a show-off beating inferior horses. And he just he, he was slightly workmanlike on the day. In the guineas, I, I didn't, not being smart after the event, I, I very much took the view before the race that I didn't really like him as a miler, as a potential miler. And for me, he shaped that way um, in the guineas. Travelled great up the front end, hung under pressure, just got a little bit tired for me close home. Um, very happy to see him coming back in trip. Um, a tricky thing to do, you know, coming back from being trained for a Guineas to, to the likes of a Commonwealth Cup can be done, of course, but um, he's short enough. Um, I don't doubt his talent and ability, but it's just, it's slightly tricky. And I, in a race like this, I'm more inclined to go for a sprinter that's been a sprinter from the day they were born, and they've always been trained as a sprinter, and this has always been their target. I'd much rather one like that than has had to kind of change course gotcha. after their, their miling campaign has gone wrong. Do you have one in mind? I have a few. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a couple. There's one, Aidan O'Brien has one. I don't know if she'll run. Yeah. Um, so perfect. She's got a few options. She's in the King's Stand. She's in this. She's in the Jersey. Um, but she's one that I think has an awful lot of raw talent, has, had, has looked at from day one. She was very raw in her first few starts and ran a great race at Ascot last season. And I, I just really liked her last run. She was good and strong late on. Just appeals as one that, in the circumstances that are likely to prevail in a Commonwealth Cup, big field, world-class gallop, loads of cover if, if, for her if she needs it. Um, might just bring the best out of her. We know these, these scat daddies, that, you know, who knows how much is in it, but they do have an exceptional record at Ascot. And I could just see her making a bit of an impact uh, if she ran here. Yeah, yeah. She'd be one to respect wherever she goes. I wouldn't necessarily like her in the King stand. That's a, okay. That'd be a big ask for, for, okay. for a relative you baby. You sound like you're only half convinced by the scat daddy thing. Do you think that's because... What, why would you not be convinced that they do go well there? It's, it's probably a sample size thing. I just don't want to... It's, it's an easy thing to roll in with, but okay. I don't know. It has. I, I actually haven't run the numbers, but I assume it wouldn't be as numerically tested as Dubawi or nothing like it. Um, so I'm just cautious of, of making a sweeping statement. We'll, we'll based check that on out that. after we come off air. We'll <laughs> see, see, see if it's, the percentage might be good, but does the AE stack up? We'll, we'll, we'll check that out with uh, uh, Scott Daddy. What's your take on this? Um, Ten Sovereigns, watching the Guineas, I thought, yes, he didn't stay. I thought more Jersey than six furlongs myself. So I thought... He Somewhere shaped like middle. a seven foot. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, it wasn't a case where I thought he was tanking along on the bridle and clearly going better than everything else two furlongs okay, out, which so is what I would want yeah. to see from horse at six foot. He was still bang there. I mean, he probably did his best work around, you know, a, approaching the furlong pole, and he was still in contention well inside the final right. furlong. So he might be suited by the drop back to six furlongs. I would have, for me, I thought he looked shaped more like a natural seven furlong okay. horse. So we can take him on. I certainly won't be backing him at a short price now. What about Lady Kea? I know I'm going against my own my own shout here in terms of a miler coming back to sprints, but mm -hmm. gosh, she's always looked fast, hasn't she? I thought she shaped more like in in the in the guineas. I thought she shaped more like the type that might actually appreciate mm. the drop to back to six furlongs. I know she's she raced over six furlongs as a two year old, so we'd need to be convinced that she's improved yep. to be able to do it. She might have strengthened up the though. natural speed though that you're. You're both yeah. looking for in this. Well, one, one thing you'd say about her is she, she, physically she isn't... She's far from imposing now. And yeah. she, I remember looking at her at Leopardstown the day of her return beforehand and then after the race. And I, I thought to myself, oh, God, you look, you look very yeah. tight and fit for this. Okay. And you might have just had your day. But then she goes and runs a, a fabulous race at Newmarket. So I wouldn't like to underestimate her too much. And like you said, God, she travels. She travels powerfully and always has done. Uh, so she's interesting. If you wanted one at the, you know, the miler dropping back, um, and yeah. that's what you want uh, on the straight course at Ascot, a horse that travels. It really mm. is. So, yeah, she's. Um, I, I must admit, I was looking at this race. I was trying to find something at a big price because I wasn't that 
thrilled with a lot at the front of the market for one reason. Lots of very solid horses. Turning your nose up at Hello You and Zane, who's beaten Calix. That's, that's not good enough. Ah, uh, well, Calix didn't run to form, though, did he? And then you look at the third, who's a, a good horse, yeah. but okay. either, I, I didn't think that was real face value, that okay. race. Fair enough. Um, and, and in your search for something at a big price, did you...? Well, I haven't really found anything that I'm... But I, wouldn't it, if, um, if he did come over, his uh, Pizzi, Pizzicato, the all-weather finals, championship finals, just because of the way he travelled in that race, that was something else. Um, I don't think he does a lot in front, and I have no idea if he's coming over. And that was a really weak race, that all-weather... The front two pulled yeah, well clear yeah. of some... I, I, I'd been watching that race for weeks ahead, and... Um, I know one or two other people in the game had been, you know, desperate to try and get something in it because it was such a weak race. Um, but it's just that the way that he travels. He's a real strong traveller. Um, all these forms on the all-weather, but it's Ascot, and Ascot is the one place where all-weather horses on the straight chat often do flourish. Interesting point. We might come back to that. Uh, before we're done with our Royal Ascot preview show here on AtTheRaces.com. If you're watching us on Facebook, don't forget... Make a little comment, drop us a little post there on this Facebook page and uh, give us a selection for Royal Ascot, uh, your tip, your nap of the week, anything like that, and we will pick a winner from all those contributions. And you, can, uh, uh, you will be notified tomorrow. The prize, by the way, I forgot to mention, two, two tickets for Saturday uh, for Royal Ascot, so make sure you're free on Saturday. And uh, we'll be in touch tomorrow, and uh, somebody will be a lucky winner. Let's move on. Uh, more Group 1 action. Coronation stakes uh, we need to move on to. And uh, that is... Uh, we're still on Friday, aren't we, with the coronation? So, um, uh, Hermosa, um, to say she's done nothing wrong is, is <laughs> always a cliche but ridiculous, I suppose. Uh, five to four, seven to two, Jubiloso, uh, pretty Pollyanna, six to one, seven to one, Castle Lady. Is, is, is this another case where it's kind of she should win, we can move on? What do, what do you think? Um, I think there's one possible fly in the ointment, um, which is Jubiloso, who is very, very hard to assess. Uh, Hermosa, I thought, was tremendously impressive last time. Absolutely rock-solid favourite. I think she's sure to run a race. She'll stay further. She's going to be a real star, I think. So um, I think there's every reason to, to think that she's a solid favourite. Jubiloso, she's hard to assess. And what I mean by that is not just that she's run twice, won twice, but um, her latest race at um, Newbury... She won so easily, and she was... I, I never got the impression that she was out of second gear. The time itself wasn't something that would say, oh, yeah, she's going to go and beat Hermosa. Um, you couldn't really give her a massive sectional upgrade to say that she could go and do it, but the overall impression was that you'd never really got anywhere near the bottom of her. Yep. So she could be, she could be the, that, the type of filly that's going to take a huge step forward. And again, I... I've, I've come unprepared. I, haven't, I don't know what the stats are, but I, I would imagine Sir Michael Stout has more than once won Group 1s here with horses that haven't previously done that, that take, make that big step up. Oh, I'm sure. And he's, you know, a bit like John Gosden. You, can, you just can't underestimate the yeah, amount exactly. that he can get them improving once they have yeah. improved. OK. Um, yeah. And, and he's in fabulous form. He's having a really good, good season. I, I had a look at his... Um, He's, I think he's run 19 older horses this year. And people often talk about horses running to form, um, you know, within a certain pound of their best. Well, I, I found, of the 19 horses, I'd looked through them, and 10 of them had run at least three pounds better than they'd ever done in their life before. So they're not just running up to form. So many of his horses, his older horses this year, have improved. Seem to be in their prime. Yeah, yeah. so um, don't be surprised if you see some more of his horses take that big leap forward. We've, That's, we've managed to get to Friday without really mentioning Sir Michael Stout's horses, and there are a few there that are mm. sort of hovering around, aren't there? So. Yeah, I, th I think Jubiloso will have to be an absolute superstar to beat Hermosa at this stage of her life, or at, at any stage, maybe. I think is going to take some whack in all season. You know, she was good at Newmarket, but she stepped forward and was better at the Curra. Mm. You know, as you say, Hugh, she'll have no problem stepping to 10, maybe 12. Yeah. And I think the mile at Ascot will suit her better than the mile at the Curra or Newmarket. Um, she's very straightforward. She, they'll go a gallop with her, whether that's leading or sitting in behind something else that's leading. I don't think it'll really matter to her. And I, I was really impressed with her at the Curra. And I, I just got the impression from Aidan O'Brien that he expects her to come forward again and find more improvement. And if she can find even a couple of more pounds, you know, she, 
This, this could be one of the vintage years for mares, couldn't mm. it, really, when you think about the horses we've already discovered, uh, discussed today. And that, you know, we've got some real potential superstar yep. mares in, in, in that division uh, you know, who can take on the Colts and probably yes. beat them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, she's, she's an absolutely rock-solid favourite. I just, like I say, Jubilo says hard, hard to assess. As Kevin yes. says, she will need to take a, a huge step forward and, and be Because she's a key special. part of the market, it mm. makes it difficult to mm. quantify her chance. Yeah. I don't think she's start. a bet at a price. If right. she was 10 to 1, then... But, but her moves are so solid that I don't, I don't think she's... But from what you've said, Kevin... I mean, she's odds again. She's 5 to 4. We don't, we don't know what price she'll be on Friday. Yeah, she's the best shorty of the week, yeah. for sure, yeah. No Point and shoot. Mind. Up and down, up and down the lines. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we got there. We got there. ka -ching. Excellent. Good work. Good work. So there you go. There's one for you. Hermosa. Oh, five to four. Five to four. Uh, Hermosa. What about the American Challenge? We've touched on it briefly here and there, but we need to get the real lowdown from our man on the ground. Peter Fornatal joins us live on the line from the United States. Hello, Peter. What a pleasure it is to be talking with you three tonight. I'm physically in New York, but I think my spirit has already made its way across the ocean, and all thoughts are based on Royal Ascot at this point with the Belmont Stakes in the books. Well, is that because you can't, couldn't wait to get away from Belmont after the, the, the tortures that you suffered with McKinsey? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was ready. I, I, we, we talked that day, and I talked about the party we were going to have and the limousine ride back, all thanks to Tacitus. In the end, we came up a length short to one who had a slightly better trip on the day. But that's okay. As my mentor in racing, William Murray, always used to say, there's always fresh. And for me, fresh right now means this Ascot meeting. I've been watching along on Facebook, following, taking copious notes. We're getting ready to make it all back and then some next week. That's the spirit, Peter. That's the spirit. There's always another race. First race tomorrow is just the same as the last race today, etc. Right, uh, what kind of a challenge have we got? I mean, obviously, Wesley Ward is, 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 is what we're talking about for the most part. But what kind of challenge do you think the, uh, that, that he in particular is bringing to, to Royal Ascot this year? I think it's a strong team. And in interviews with Wesley Ward, you have to be careful. He's a type who's very optimistic about a lot of his charges. But this year in particular, between some of the pedigrees on display and crucially, some of the speed figures earned by his horses. I think it's a stronger group than the last couple of years, and I would be surprised if he doesn't continue his streak. He's got, what, 10 wins over the last 10 years at Ascot and a very good chance to go one better, if not more, in 2019. OK. Um, which one are you most excited about personally, Peter? Is there one that you're thinking, this is our American banker? Nia Beth looks very strong for the Albany to me based on the speed figures. She ran on the buyer speed scale in the low 90s in her first and only race. That field, the form is working out okay. Seven starters out of that field with a win and two seconds. The work tab has looked very strong since. Interestingly, the work tab on, I'd say, three in particular – has been, has been very strong and with some commonality, some horses working together with Anna's Fast, having worked with Nyabeth three times and also worked with Maven once. I think it might be an instance where the, wind, the way the wind blows for one of that triumvirate could be a pointer for how well all three of them are going to run because they've been working together and been very impressive to my eye. But of the three, Nia Beth gets my preference. I think the Albany is going to be the target. That's just a very big speed figure. We've seen the wards come over and be competitive who've run much slower than that. We don't have anything like the massive number that uh, Lady Aurelia put up a few years ago. But Nia Beth is within you know, three or four lengths of that, and that might be good enough to make the rest of them be running for second in the Albany. Not an easy spot, but sitting here now, Nia Beth would be the one I'd back immediately. That's interesting because we, we had our two-year-old uh, time 
number cruncher. Simon Rowland's giving us his analysis earlier on. Yeah, he had quite a few two-year-olds on his radar, as you'd expect. But Nyabeth, uh, he has very highly rated on his figures as well. So that's two votes for Nyabeth uh, in the Albany, which is, which is more than enough for me. Uh, to be persuaded. Uh, in terms of um, Royal Ascot, you're, you're a massive racing fan, Peter. I bumped into you at the Cheltenham Festival. I know you love your British and your Irish racing. You're over in Ireland when you can as well. Uh, but for, for race fans in general in the States, if you follow American racing, are you a fan of Royal Ascot? Will they be tuning in, trying to catch what's happening? Absolutely. There's been an explosion. I mean, Ward really gets a lot of credit, I think, for turning Americans on to the Royal meeting. And then that has gone to another level the last few years with the races being on NBC TV. And that coverage has been spectacular, picking up uh, some of the domestic coverage and then sprinkling in their own bits tailored towards American fans and highlighting the American storyline. And no conversation about the impact of Ascot in America should occur without mentioning Teppen and that wonderful run a couple of years ago. And I think now, finally, Betters, as well as fans and horsemen, are starting to see all the promise of the meeting. And I expect it to go even better this year with stronger international tote pools with the intermingling with Hong Kong. That's going to create more opportunities for Americans to get involved. And hopefully we're going to continue to see a strong American challenge in the years to come. I see no reason why it isn't going to happen. Ask it doing everything right to make this a great international meeting, not just, of course, in the United States, but some interesting stuff going on around the world, particularly in Asia, to give us that Olympic-type flair. And I think U.S. race fans really respond to that idea of the international competition and, of course, the, the, also the tie-in with the Breeders' Cup, having seen horses who've run so well at Ascot come over and do well in the Breeders' Cup and then horses go from the Breeders' Cup and do well in the English Classic. There's a great cross-pollination these days between English and Irish racing and American racing, and I think that's just going to continue to develop as time goes on, and I'm happy to be at the center of it, at least in terms of talking about these things on podcasts and television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and talking about it really, really well. It's a, it's a good point you make. There's three or four um, races at Ascot a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup, I think, these days, aren't they, as well? So uh, we will see, I'm sure, horses from, from next week making their way uh, back stateside for the Breeders' Cup. And the Japanese horse uh, that ran at Belmont the other day, it was about $5 million uh, bet in the, in, the, in the Japanese pool on that race as a, as a, as a result. So it, it is an increasingly uh, international game, isn't it? It's, it's a global game. Uh, these days. Give, give us some... Um, have you got another horse for us, Peter? Another play or another nap or one horse that you're really looking forward to seeing? Maybe not from the stateside team, but just generally. Well, I do have another one from the stateside team. I do want to talk about it. potential bet, and that is Imprimis in the King stand. Yes. Obviously, I can't call this a nap. Very, very, very difficult race. But this is a horse, if you just look at the last race quickly on paper, you might think he was flattered by the pace set by Bound for Nowhere. And there's no doubt that it was very fast that day. But you have to remember the way his race began, stumbling to his knees out of the gate, and also the fact that this was a day that horses just weren't making up ground, it didn't seem, on the dirt or the turf. In short, infamous, it was a monster effort, as was his race two back when he beat some very good horses on their home turf at Gulfstream, his last work on the turf looked great. I think he's setting on a really big effort and is worth backing. But it's obviously a very salty group. And some people are probably shaking their head thinking, I don't know about the ones at the top of the market. I know about them. I think Imprimis might be able to hang with them. Imprimis, uh, brilliant. He, he was on his nose, wasn't he, coming out of the gates there. And a fantastic recovery. I, we, we did briefly mention him in passing, but we didn't explore it properly. And you have dug us out of that hole. So well done, Peter. And we will watch out for Imprimis as well. Many thanks for your contribution as ever. Have a wonderful Royal Ascot, mate. Cheers. Hope to see you soon. Peter Fornatal from the States there looking for... He loves his British and Irish racing. He's, a, he's an all-round super fan, isn't he, of, of, of the sport? Loves it. You know, loves I, I, I often meet up with Peter there in the, one of the mornings of Royal Ascot and we sit down and solve the world's problems. He, abso he absolutely loves it. He's a great man. Good stuff. So watch out for Imprimis uh, there in the King's stand. Uh, we move on to the final uh, Group 1 of uh, the week, I think, uh, on Saturday, aren't we, with the uh, Diamond Jubilee. And uh, we are looking here at... Invincible Army, Inns of Court, Blue Point we've touched on for the other race, the Tin Man, 
Uh, Bound for Nowhere, Dream of Dreams, Sounds of Marley. We could go anywhere with this, couldn't we? So um, for four-year-olds and up, six furlongs this one. Anything caught your eye on this, Hugh, or not particularly? Well, I backed Invincible Army for the um, Commonwealth Cup last year. OK. Around 12 to 1, something like that. Yeah. And I was very pleased with myself going into the day because he was a fair bit shorter <laughs> and he ran no sort of a race. Um, so he's clearly run two big races this year. Didn't think it was the strongest Duke of York last time. Went off about four to one or something, didn't he, you shrewd? He was, well, yeah. I don't know what price he was. He was yeah. definitely, I mean, I tipped <laughs> him a little while beforehand. Uh, the reason I liked him was partly because he had, he'd run a big all-weather figure and that was, oh, you okay. know, I thought that translated quite well and he'd, he'd run well in his uh, comeback race. I think he's short enough for this race. Um, uh, it may be that he's strengthened up now and that he's stronger as a four-year-old and that he's going to go on. Um, because, as I say, he's put two really good runs together. You can't crab his form this year, yep. but I don't think it entitles him to be quite that short. And I, it's not often I've, I've, I'd have ever said this in my lifetime, but I prefer the French sprinters in, in, this, in this race to it's him. Not often any of us say that, but they, they, they've got a few <laughs> at the moment, haven't they? Well, City of Light and Inns yeah. of Court, they're both... I mean, City, um, City of Light was second last year, and um, that was a really, really good run. Inns of Court has been quite impressive as well, and I think they're both entitled to be strong contenders. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd make the case for Inns of Court, for sure. Invincible Army, you know, the wheels came off with him a little bit last season. He disappointed in the Commonwealth Cup. His final start last season, he hung like a gate, like a horse with a, with a serious physical problem, and he disappeared. But he's been good in his two starts this year, but ultimately, you know, he's beaten Major Jumbo twice. By, by two lengths or so. Major. Right, this race we, we, we're going to has both of them in, I think, doesn't it? We should have in, is, yeah, Inns of Court and City Light, so it's a perfect moment to pick up on both of them. Ah, magic. But look, Major Jumbo, he, he's, he's a good, solid horse. He's not a Group 1 horse, and with all due respect to him. Um, so I'd be with Hugh. I think he's short enough on what he's done. But Inns of Court, who is a really interesting horse, he was, you know, touched off in a, in a pre Jean prop, wasn't it, as a... As a as a three-year-old, you know, he's a, he's a miler. And it's taken him a while just to get the hang of sprinting. But what he did last time, I thought, was very impressive over five. He's beaten Major Jumbo by further than Invincible Army did in his two goals at it this year. And he proved, beyond, if there was any lingering doubt, he proved that a, f a fast surface is fine for him. You know, there was an element yep. of doubt. Yep. But I think he, he got rid of that doubt last time. And going back to six, I think, won't be a problem at all. And he's double the price of an Invincible Army, and I just think that's that's wrong. Yeah, and the City of Light, a little bit bigger again. There's not a lot between them on that evidence, is there? City of Light was coming back at him at the end. I think the case for City of Light is that he's probably the strongest stayer over six films, even though uh, Inns of Court has been racing over further for all Inns of Court definitely looks to have improved since he's, mm. since he's chopped in trip. Um, but um, City, City of Light's um, got the strong course form, which we know means counts for plenty at Ascot. So I think you could make a case for it. I don't know. Um, Inns of Court is really, really... He travels so strongly. He does catch the eye with the way he travels. And he could... He looks the type who could... Con now that he's found his form at, at sprint trips, he could carry on and be a really, really good sprinter. It's funny how that happens sometimes. Mm. I, so, I suppose your natural inclination of a big team or a big trainer, you, you want to make a classic horse, don't you, as a, mm. you know, in the, into that classic campaign. But, and, uh, Turns out you've just got a really quick horse. Yeah, <laughs> and it can just take them a while to, to learn how to sprint as well. You know, it's a, it's a sure. it's quite a different discipline to to miling, especially at, at that tip top level. Mm. And I just think it took him a while just to adjust and find that pace that was clearly in there. And I, I was just really encouraged. I was really impressed with him last time. If you knew nothing about him and you watched last time yeah. over five, you'd say there's an out and out five furlong sprinter because yeah. he just he travelled, he quickened, he did everything you, you'd want to see your five furlong sprinter do. But we know with the full body of evidence that he clearly, you know, six shouldn't be a problem, should it? <laughs> you know, he no, should be. He should be just. As, yeah. He should be just as effective. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, two French challenges there, and as you said, not often we say it, but if they're there, they're there, and, and they've got two two good sprinters at the moment. It would seem. Uh, now we promised you some more of Hugh's punting pointers. There might be any other business if there's a horse that we haven't touched on that either of you wanted to uh, mention, then, then do so. But we started with a punting pointer uh, from Hugh, which was the Dubawi. Mm -hmm. Stat, and we, we're going from a different angle now. Your next punting pointer is it's about the draw okay. um, and on the straight course in sprints. Uh, no, no, are we, oh. are we, no, 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 I, no, I said no. that because many people will be expecting that. Ah, oh, right, okay, something completely okay. different. You, you threw me there. <laughs> um, yeah, we're looking at one mile four, four furlong handicaps, and 
This is basically the record of one mile full for long handicaps with 17 plus runners. Arbitrary cutoff point, I, I acknowledge, but it's pretty similar. It just is a fairly similar results if you choose 16 or 18 as, as a cutoff point. You would think that the inside stalls would be the place to be. The, rec the evidence shows anything but. Um, and um, stalls one to five, two out of 119, massive level stakes lost. They've really struggled. Stalls six to, six to 10, there was a 66 to one winner in there, which has reduced the losses significantly. But again, wow. not particularly good record. And you can see as you get higher in the, in the draw, the, the outside stalls, which um, you would expect to be the unfavoured draws, have actually done really well, provided the most winners and the most profit. And it's something that, that racing refuses to acknowledge, isn't it, this particular stat? Because even last year, I recall trainers being, you know, giving their mm. quotes before the race that were drawn high and going, oh, we have a terrible draw, we're drawn out in the car park, we have no chance. And, yes. Yeah. This sounds odd. It's okay, okay, well, uh, that's a good draw. Yeah. It took a long, long time for people to recognise that it's possible that all very low draws of one mile four furlong at Epsom might not be. But now trainers and jockeys mm. are all talking about it and yeah. it's quite, I think it's generally fairly accepted that yeah. there are difficulties. There, there is a case though, Hugh, you can look at Epsom, you, you can kind of see why that might yep. be the case yep. because you're, 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 you're starting to turn and then you might lose your position, then you're mm -hmm. having to get back in. And, why, at Ascot though, it's, it's a straightforward oval sort of a track. That's a really good point and there, there isn't the obvious reason why. The only, thing, the only thing I would say is that when I watch races at Ascot, when, normally one of the things I watch when I'm watching racing on a round course is horses that get forced wide for ground loss and especially if they race keenly. Time after time I see horses race two or three wide at Ascot and they're absolutely fine. It doesn't, it's not a course where I would upgrade a horse unless it, it's really wide and really free. It's not a course where I would necessarily, and I don't know why. I have no idea. Trying to see why that the, the, because they the move the rail so around. Long, so, so maybe, mm. but it's sometimes things it's just. The, 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 I'm sure there is an explanation, but it's just mm. really not evident. But you look at the evidence; mm. it's clearly some, there's something there. Clearly, but it's a hefty sample size. For yeah. Like, you know, it's a decent sample size anyway. It's, um, I think uh, something like three quarters of the of the races over a mile four furlong with handicap races have gone to horses from the top half of the jaw. That I shouldn't I be happening. I've got another graphic actually, just to, just to spell that out, um, which, which, here we go. There we go, 88 handicaps with double figure fields. This is since the track was relayed in 2006, but... Um, 61 from 88. From the top half of the jaw. It's remarkable, isn't it? Mm. And it's one of those cases where, where the numbers are so strong that you, you know, you're happy to be content to not have an explanation. Mm. There's clearly something there. We don't know what it is, I but it, it would be totally foolish to ignore it given the strength of the evidence. Is there a case, I mean, so, because the sample, that's quite a big sample size, because immediately you think, well, what if it, by some fluke, the horses drawn in the, the lower half were all priced 33 to one plus, or, or, or most of them were, you know, what if they were, mm. It just happens. Lots of outsiders were drawn low, and lots of fancy horses were drawn. To be fair, I haven't done. I haven't. I run out of time to do the actual yeah. over ex expected. But, but the, the, the profits that we're seeing, you know, I think. Um, the, and go, getting back to the reasoning behind it, I don't think it's anything to do with track position. In that, it's not because all the wide drawn horses are dropped in and come late. Because there's been plenty have gone forward, mm. but not all of them. Plenty have been just ridden mid division. There isn't a, a running style that seems to suit it. Well. I think of it because I will forget within seconds. I made two notes uh, based on comments that you've been making and, and a couple of words have come up more than once. One is travelling, travel, mm -hmm. travelling, horses travelling. Expand on that first of all. Um, now we are back specifically to the straight course and, right. and I'd apply this onto the straight course but when I'm looking at races at Ascot um, on the straight course the two things I'm really, I'm ideally looking for a hold up horse which isn't to say that Prominent races can't win, clearly they can and do. Um, but I do like a strong travelling holder horse who perhaps pounces late. It does seem that a lot of races, particularly in big fields, if there's a good pace, a run to suit those. And as a result... You can experience heartbreak with those. Oh, well. absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, it, it can, you know, the jockey can either get it very right or very wrong, but the, certain jockeys have got a habit of getting it right to ask it more yes. often than others. I also do like, um, as I hinted at earlier, I like the angle of... Um, I like to see horses who've run a big figure on the all-weather on the street. Well, that was my other word, all-weather, which were, 
is, I suppose, counterintuitive, but perhaps because of lingering sort of prejudices about the quality of all-weather racing. I don't know, because we're talking about Royal Ascot here. So what's behind that? Where does that come from? Well, Ascot's the sand-based track, the straight track. There's a lot of sand in the... In the, uh, in the composition of the surface and I assume, and I think a lot of people assume that, um, that, that that helps. Doncaster, which also has a sort of sand-based surface, is also quite favourable to hold up horses. I don't think it's quite to the same degree that you want those strong travellers, but it is it's similar in a lot of ways. It's and interesting because I've stumbled on a, a different strategy without having your expertise, which is, on, on, again, on the straight course at Ascot, since it was redone mm -hmm. principally, but on the straight course at Ascot, more in handicaps than stakes races, but on that straight course at Ascot, I want a horse that is either ridden or trained by someone called Jamie. <laughs> by, by, by which I mean trained by Jamie Osborne mm -hmm. in, in, in hunt, hunt Cups and Wokings and things like that, or ridden by Jamie Spencer, mm -hmm. who will produce those, sometimes they combine, of course, to, uh, to produce that effect. And, 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 and I have crunched the numbers on that, and the AE is very strong for both of them. They both punch way above their weight in those circumstances. If you look at the jockeys that Jamie likes to use, he, he uses Spencer, um, and he uses Adam Kirby, who's very adept at executing those kind of tactics. And that's, and that's the kind of jockey he was himself. He was a sit quiet in the saddle, wait, wait, and, and get your timing right. And that's the kind of... Um, jockey that he tends to, to look for, and I think Jamie's got a Jamie Osborne. This is, I think he's got a pretty good understanding of the kind of horse you need yeah. for Ascot. Well, um, you better hope so because he trains one <laughs> for you, doesn't he? <laughs> who was ridden by Jamie Spencer last year? Um, yeah. Uh, Tell us who we're talking about. Yeah, we're talking about Raising Sand, yeah. who all being well, will run in the Hunt Cup, and you know we're quite excited about it because he's a he's a bit of an Ascot specialist. He's won three times there, including the big um, I can't remember the name of the sponsor, but the big sponsor handicap. Um, last uh, last autumn, and he ran very well in the Victoria Cup. And he's I, I've Cup, another one, yeah. Yeah, I've I've, I've owned, well, I've part owned, had shares in a lot of horses, lots and lots of them. But this is by far my favourite. Um, he's just a, um, he's a very likable horse to to own because he shouldn't really be a good ho that as good a horse as he is because his legs are all over the place. That's why we, we watch him galloping. He's like Bambi on ice, <laughs> all over the place. But uh, he is, he's developed into a really good horse. He's been very well handled by the, uh, Jamie and his team. And, um, yeah, he's won five races for us. He cost 16,000. He's taken us to all the big meetings. So, you know, we... we He's got a very happy band of owners, put it that way. And we can confirm that earlier on, as we were making our way through the Sky Campus, Hugh was dancing in puddles. He was rejoicing with the rain. Oh, you want some rain, yeah? That... It might be a week too early. If it was like this, um, he, he goes very well in wet ground. Okay. Deep ground, but particularly when it's wet, he goes very well. So. Well, you never know. You never know. It might not stop raining between now. And then any other horses for you? Any stats for you? You haven't statted us. <laughs> uh, are you going to join that? Club or are you no, still no, no, stats schmatz guy? No satisfaction <laughs> on this occasion, I'm afraid. <laughs> any other horses or any, any, any anything else you wanted to touch oh, on? Oh, I've got oh. dozens. How much time do we have? <laughs> give, give us one or two. Um, in term, Simon covered the two-year-olds very well. One that he did give a strong mention to, and I very much echo, is Bombproof. I was very impressed with him. It, 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 he was sneaky for a little while, but the form is working out so well that I think everyone's starting to pay attention now. Most of the talk seems to be Windsor Castle. I wouldn't be shocked if he went to Norfolk. And he's a double figure price for that. It's funny how it turns out the Norfolk can often be a little bit easier to win than the Windsor Castle. And it's a smaller field generally. Uh, and you're a little bit less at the mercy of the draw sometimes. And I think he's very good. I think he's very fast. I think uh, I think he could be a Don't very good me. horse. I'm just making another note on Bomb Proof. Go on. Yep. <laughs> um, so he's won. That, uh, that I'd give a mention to. Um, are we going to move on to the handicaps? Do, yeah. Or, or is, is, I know we only have entries for the, the Hunt Cup exactly, and the Wokingham, yeah, yeah. so it's, okay, yeah. it's tricky. But uh, in the Hunt Cup, I just, I'll just i give a little shout out to, to an old friend in Settle for Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, won, the, won the race with his mouth open last year. It was, it was remarkable, really, to see a race like the Hunt Cup won like that. He's gone missing a little bit since. He's had some issues. He's had a breeding operation when he was out in Dubai, but he's had a couple of runs, and I thought there was great encouragement to take from his most recent one. Um, it's, it would be no secret what he's being trained for. Um, David Mernan is trying to peak him for the day that showed him the best effect last year. And the manner in which he won, you know, if Dave can get him back in, in the sort of shape that he was in there, you know, it's a hunt cup. You need a, you need an amount of luck, especially with him, uh, given his style. But the way he went through the race, the way he ultimately won, 
Um, you'd, be, you'd be getting excited about him if he, if he can get him back in that shape. And he's, I know what the closer we get, of course, previous winners come to the forefront for, for many people, but he's still a, quite a big price at the minute, given 14s, his... 14s, I think, 12s, 14s, something like that. I think there might be some 16s, but given yeah. his, his preparation has been a little bit quietly, quietly. And there, there might... Look, if he turns up in the day, he's probably going to be a single-figure price, is he? Yeah, and he was... Yeah, could easily mm. be. Yeah, he yeah. was impressive last year, and he was... Although he was in what turned out to be the right group. He was a bit on the wing of that group as well, and mm. he was seeing daylight from a fair way out. I was, and he's another horse who's he's got a lot of all-weather back form as well, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he did yeah. a lot of winning um, at Dundalk. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I was I was having a quick look through it this morning, and my first thought was, yeah, he's been trained for the race again. Mm. That was it. It does look that way, doesn't it? So, yeah. and I don't know anything about you know. It just it just stood to me that this will be. His, Big target for the year. Be true of most of the field, of course, but yep. be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, never ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I don't know the answer. When was the last back to back Hunt Cup winner? <sighs> no, a few that should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is. One, um, one for the Facebook commenters, yeah, if you absolutely. have it on the tip of your tongue. You might yeah. a pair of tickets yeah. if you know the answer to that. Stick it on the <laughs> Facebook page. If you, and, and if you haven't posted already, if you're watching on Facebook, put a comment there. You do have a chance of winning a pair of tickets. Now, uh, just to round things up, I'm going to ask you. Uh, you may have done it already. Uh, you know, give us your bed of the week or your horse of the week, your angle of the week. Maybe it's a strong travelling or weather horse. I don't know. What that will be it for me. Yeah. Um, m most of my bets, as I said earlier, will be will come at the from races that open at the five day entry stage, and uh, I'll be looking at those. But I'll have a good look at the handicaps on the straight course and the two year old races. But uh, in the handicaps, certainly, I'll be looking at the t strong travelling uh, types. I'll probably hold up horses. Um, doesn't mean that I will always necessarily end up. Going for one of those, there might yeah. be other more compelling reasons. I've, I've tipped front runners before yeah. at Royal Ascot on the straight track, but that's probably the strongest um, sort of. That's your hunting ground. Yeah, that's, that's the strongest yeah. angle that I would be okay. looking at. Here's a fun game for you to play at home during the course of Royal Ascot. <laughs> Try and work out what Hugh's going to select in those big straight handicaps. And you know, using this analysis, you might you might be able to guess, which will be a fun game to play. There's no prizes, but <laughs> one one sort of fun fact for you, if you, if you had managed, you'd need hindsight, obviously. If you'd managed to back every horse that earned the in running comment held up at Ascot on the straight course since the track was reopened, you'd be about 100 and something points up. No. Oh. Now, there's a selection bias inherent to that, in that that excludes all the ones that were things like slowly away or behind or outpaced. Yeah. So, held up does employ, apply a degree of volition on the jockey's part, and yes. therefore it's a positive yeah. comment. But if you compare it with somewhere like um, the Rowley course at Newmarket and apply the exact same filter, you're looking at massive losses of mm. 450 pounds or something like 450 points, something like that. Interesting. So, and of course, these days you can go beyond that and you know look at the VT and mm. um, and see whether that. One, comment one, is one, that. one horse I'd throw in that yep. apropos that that thing, Keystroke in the um, uh, what's he in the Diamond Jubilee, isn't he? Um, he would um, he won the Abernant. OK, a strongly run race where he was probably suited by the pace, even at Newmarket. But if he'd asked me at the start of the season, he's, if he said to me he's going to go um, sprinting, which track he's going to suit him most and which he's going to suit him least, given his run style, I would have said Newmarket one of the least and asked okay. one of the most. And he's, he's about 50 to 1 chance for that race. He does need another career best. We're all scrolling down frantically, can't get to him. But yeah, he, he does need another. He does need another career best. But sure. he's an all-weather. He's a horse who's run most on the all-weather most of his life. He's moved to Stuart Williams and uh, he won at Kempton on his first start and he won at Newmarket. And yes, he got the run of a race and that bare form isn't good enough. But I could see him travelling really strongly and looking a big, you know, looking a big player certainly. A furlong out. Good and stuff. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you're going to give us your nap of the meeting, Kevin. Before you do, the last back-to-back -back Hunt Cup winners, well, Hunt Cup winner, I'm quite surprised you didn't get it because it's quite recent. Oh. 1947-48. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you remember it well, do you? <laughs> Master vote. Don't remember that. Yeah, one for the Christmas quiz, yeah. You might miss one of them, maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Give us, give us your bet of the week or your angle of the week, your play of the week, anything you like. If you're having a bet right now, which I'd imagine plenty of people looking in will be doing, I, I really don't think you could go wrong backing Magical right now. Mm. You're, you're going to beat the market, I suspect. Well, if see if class doesn't turn up, you're going to be... Yeah, you're going to be in, <laughs> you're going to be in great shape. And even, <laughs> even if they all turn up, I'd still fancy her. 
Okay. But I just think there's a, a strong possibility a few, uh, certainly the front five or six in the market, won't turn up and you, you'll find yourself in good shape. Yeah, but don't forget to leave some cash to buy the wheelbarrow for the Hamosa money. Yeah? <laughs> Let's forget that as well. Well, if you're inclined towards a double. <laughs> there you go. Good stuff. Many thanks uh, to Kevin Blake and to Hugh Taylor. It's been fabulous guests. It's been great to get the band back together. In fact, to form the band for the first time in its entirety here for this uh, attheraces.com Royal Ascot preview show. If you're watching on Facebook, there's still time. If you're quick uh, to post a comment, and you could be in with a chance of winning uh, those two tickets to Ascot on the Saturday. It would be great to see you there. But many thanks. Thanks to everyone who's watched, whether you're watching on Facebook or on At The Races live or recorded. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful Royal Ascot.